2. This is debate on clauses 74 to 76. The question is at part 2, stand part. Uh, Sir William Seo. Mr Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Um, may I just respond briefly to um, some statements made by the Minister earlier when he said that earlier that about 3,000 savings will be made to developers per unit as a result of this bill. I have to say to the Minister, um, you know, can he take a call and guarantee that those savings will be passed on to home buyers? Because we heard also from the Tauranga District Council that their estimation that there m perhaps could be savings of about 750 per unit. But mind you, uh, Auckland Council submitted that savings that they were estimating would be about 1,000 per unit. And, and I have to ask, if I were a developer, I would be asking myself, can we realistically pass those savings on to the home buyer? And that's the challenge we want to put squarely on the forehead of that particular minister now, because he needs to provide guarantees. We will help him. We will help him by supporting this bill to make sure that he lives up to their promise of building more houses. And as shallow as the savings might be, we want to be able to ensure that, uh, that people who need homes are able to access homes, affordable homes. And I know that earlier today when my colleague um, Phil Twyford asked the Minister of Housing about how he was doing with building houses in those set-apart uh, locations in Auckland, um, and he said that they were moving at a cracking pace. And, and that was after how many years in government? Six, Six long years. That was also after they would recognised that there is a housing crisis. But if that's their cracking pace, and still there are no houses being built today, so then we need to know whether they are quite serious uh, about that. But I do want to come to the supplementary <coughs> order papers. Yes, the debate's not about housing, all right? Well, uh, just... Uh. Sir William, sir. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I beg to differ, sir. Ah. Uh. OK. Look, let me address the supplementary <laughs> <laughs> let, let me uh, then go towards the supplementary order name uh, by Labour in my name, 460, where we're asking uh, this House to pass into legislation the supplementary order paper that ensures that schedule... Um, which schedule is it? To ensure that schedule, one of the schedules uh, in that clause. Well, look, the schedules are in part one. Um, we're on part two. <laughs> no, no, We've covered the, the schedules. The schedules are part one, and that we had the debate on clauses four to seventy-three and schedules one to ten. Part two amendments to other enactments. So you can talk to amendments. Amendments to local government electoral act. Amendments to local government Auckland Council act. A, a point of your order, Eugenie Sage. Clarification: You said that the schedules are in relation to part one, but part two actually refers to schedule eight, schedule nine, and schedule ten. So aren't some of the schedules related to part two? Look, I'm just seeking advice because my advice differs and, and I don't want to put you wrong. So can you just um, be with me a moment? And, and um, the member may well be right, so I'm just... Um can you advise us to some Consequential amendments, not, not what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. 
Page 99. Right. <clears throat> Just to clarify uh, the points that have been raised by point of order, uh, if we look, the schedules that can be included in part two are found on page 115, which is schedules eight, um, schedules eight, nine, and ten. All right. Okay. So, uh, Sewer William Sewer. In terms of Schedule 8, amendments to the Local Electoral Act, there were some issues raised, sir, in terms of whether a person can hold more than one position, whether it be local board or also um, holding a position on the licensing trust as opposed to holding a, a position in local board. And I want to say, sir, that there, I don't think that this bill goes far enough in protecting and in, in ensuring that the conflicts of interest between a person that holds the local board position in one area and a person that hold, and then holding another position in the local board of a subsequent area. There was also debate during that particular part of the bill, sir, in public submissions, where a person who holds a local board position also holds a council position or a person holding either one of those positions and also holding a, a position on the district health board and I would ask the minister whether he would like to make to get up on his feet and make some comments about how do we prevent potential conflicts of interest in terms of people who may hold more than one position either in local board council or the district health board sir so Mr. Jim, so. um, and and that's a significant part of uh, of that particular schedule. In terms of um, the, the Schedule 9, amendments to the Local Government Oakland Council Act, the, the proposal by the government is to replace section 12 bar 3 with the new section which reads, a local board does not have separate legal standing order, standing from the Auckland Council, and therefore without limitation may not acquire, hold, or dispose of property, or enter into contracts, or appoint, suspend, or remove employees, or commence or be a party to, or be heard in legal proceedings. And after section 12 bar 3 insert, nothing in this section limits the responsibility of a local board to make the decisions of the Auckland Council that are allocated to it in accordance with section 16. So, I suppose that needs to be cleared, and there were s submissions who raised the concern that by imposing local boards as part of this government's amalgamation agenda throughout the country, what is happening is there's the potential for this government to therefore replace competent, democratic, existing district councils, local territory authorities, with that of a local board. And whilst the Auckland City might now be finding its way through that particular structure and learning, yes, they are given certain amounts of powers, probably a little bit more than old, the old existing community boards, they definitely do not have the same powers as that held by a council. And so the fear that it was raised, the concerns that were raised by some submitters, is that they do not want to have this government imposing local boards as a replacement of existing competent district councils. In fact, it goes back to the argument, sir. There is strong and growing opposition to this government's amalgamation agenda. And it also goes back to the earlier discussion that we had in part one about this government uh, looking to ensure that it imposes its will on local government in terms of service delivery. And there are existing local governments, and I want to say existing local governments today, who have strong arguments and a strong case to forward as to why they should not be amalgamated because they currently are able to deliver services in a shared way 
without the imposition of this government legislating that for them. And I name the Bay of Plenty region in particular, and the concern that they would have is they have a strong case that they are able to work together, manage their assets, etc. But by imposing uh, amalgamation on them without meaningful uh, contribution or input by the residents and ratepayers, what we're essentially telling them, sir, is that their existing way of doing things is no good. Well, who is this government to judge that particular region when they are managing multi-billion dollar assets in terms of the ports and are able to sustain themselves? Who are we to make that judgment? But what I can say, based on the Auckland Council experience, is that if this government continues in its relentless um, misguided uh, attempt to amalgamate and force those amalgamations on the region, what the Bay of Plenty can look forward to is the loss of expertise, loss of environmental expertise that they currently have, a loss of leadership, a loss of a vision for that particular region, because this government doesn't have a vision for the region, let alone have a vision for the country. So how on earth can they do that? And I would say, sir, that it would be wrong for this government to continue along this pace without making those required amendments to improve on this bill. But as I said beginning, we want to help this government keep their promise of building more houses. We have laid the gauntlet for a challenge to them. Build 100,000 houses in 10 years' time. We want to see that happen, rather than the rhetoric that they've been trying to fool New Zealanders um, with. I call Eugenie Sage. The chair. Um, in terms of the uh, part.